Hello, Mark. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. How are you? I'm very well, Mark. I might ask you to introduce yourself and your professional background and how you ended up starting Vita Access. Well, that's a pleasure. So uh, my name is Mark Larkin. I have an academic sort of science background, biological sciences degree, PhD, many years ago now, uh, sadly. Uh, and then my career has been in um, health economics outcomes research for, for most of it. And latterly, we started working on uh, real world evidence advice to clients. But at my previous company, we didn't have the ability to generate any data. So I thought there was a really uh, nice opportunity to build a company that also generates data, uh, but understands the science as well. So we don't think of ourselves as a uh, software company by any means. We have a platform to generate data from patients and caregivers predominantly. Um, but it's really the science as well. So we can do this, the, all of the, 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 the services around that, thinking about the protocol, the research questions, how the data might be used, et cetera. So that's really what we do at our, our Vitaxis. We have a focus on uh, patient-centered research, particularly coming from patients and caregivers. A lot of it in rare diseases, but also oncology and, and a few other therapeutic areas. Well, I might ask, what are patient-reported outcomes? Well, very basically, it's it's uh, data that are reported by patients. Now, those can be in two broad categories. One is uh, validated, what are called patient reported outcomes, or confusingly also called PROMs, patient reported outcomes measures instruments, which are standardized questionnaires that are given mostly to patients, but it could also be to caregivers. So those standardized questionnaires, one category, but you could also ask patients or caregivers anything you like. You could ask them, so the data that they are going to provide to you, uh, which might not be validated surveys, uh, instruments like that, uh, is the other type. So it's very broad. And I suppose the, the, the nature of that uh, broad category also reflects the very diverse range of designs of studies that you could have to reflect different situations that a sponsor might be in, different ways that they might want to um, resolve uncertainty that that's linked to their product or a particular disease. Okay, so how do patient reported outcomes work with regulatory authorities and how do they work with health technology assessment organizations? Well, um, those two audiences are, have slightly different um, requirements. So, you know, pa patient reported outcomes instrument, validated instruments have the uh, highest level of rigor for regulatory audiences like EMA uh, and FDA. Uh, Clinical trials don't always have those, by the way. They might have clinical outcomes as their primary endpoints. That's more, more typically the way that, that works. But increasingly, it's been recognized that even if, even if the primary endpoints are clinical outcomes, patient-reported outcomes can play a really important as, uh, um, role in clinical trials as well. So there's been a tendency to increase the number of PRO instruments that are in clinical trials. Um, and for, for health technology assessment agencies, such as NICE and, and uh, comparable groups in other countries, there's been changes in their frameworks that they recognize the, the P, these PRO instruments over the last few years. So these uh, sort of tendencies, both in the sort of regulated clinical trials world and in the HTA world, for the increasing acceptance and use of, P, use of PROs have been uh, going for the last few years and continue to go. Okay, so... How do you actually collect data? Do you do it through digital instruments? Do you do it through interviews? How does it work with a patient? So the, the, the main part of our business is doing uh, prospective studies, really. So we've built our own uh, uh, electronic data capture platform, and, and we can also run analytics off it, which is called Vitaxis Real. So for a prospective study, we would, uh, and, the, and the designs vary quite a lot, but let's say there's a design where we would recruit patients in a, in a traditional clinical site. The, the clinical team would provide information about the study to their patient they're treating to, to assess whether the, the, the patient uh, may wish to be in the trial or not, the study or not. Uh, if they do, they go through informed consent. Uh, they will sort of register onto our platform, a bit like, you know, you'll be familiar with registering for a, any old app. Um, and then after that, they will be asked a series of questions over an ex the, the period of time for the, the follow-up in, in the study, which could be as short as, you know, a month. It could be five years. And there'll be different of these standardized questionnaires that will pop up on their 
on their device saying, asking them about different aspects of their experience with a treatment or a disease. So that could be health related quality of life. It could be fatigue. It could be pain, you know, things like that. And typically those instruments, those PROs are repeatedly uh, administered over the duration of the, the, the uh, follow up of the study. It could be weekly or it could be monthly. It really depends on the, the research questions that the sponsor is trying to get get through. So, yeah, but they appear on the phone and you, you know, each one takes, you know, maybe just a couple of minutes uh, and you answer these standardized questionnaires. And it's also in your sort of home language, if you like. So typically the studies that we do are um, over, over different countries. So that all this content is localized. So if you're in France, you get it in French. You wouldn't be expected to, to do it in a foreign language. Absolutely. OK, so how do you approach patient organizations? How do you work with a patient organization? Well, you know, we found, and we've been doing this, I guess, for six, almost seven years now, that patient advocacy groups are really valuable partners for this type of work. Um, because the studies, you know, at, at the, probably at the most basic level, if you're going to do a, a study like this, it pays to really test it and get input from people who know the most about these conditions. And, you know, there's two broad categories of that. One is clinicians, obviously they're the, the clinical experts, but patient advocacy groups and patients themselves, they're experts by experience. So every study that we have done has been improved by refining it and testing it with those key stakeholders. So, you know, in, in and, and this isn't, in some ways, I'd say this isn't rocket science. In non-healthcare uh, circles, if you're going to do some sort of project, doesn't it make sense to test it with the sort of, you know, people concerned before you launch it? Of course it does. So, you know, this is in some ways relatively basic, but yeah, not everyone does that. So these patient groups are, are really valuable uh, partners and we always learn from them. Um, and we found that when we approach them, um, if we if we have an approach, which is an, an, a sort of governance framework, which we do and we, we, we've refined over, you know, lots of studies over a period of years, if we have a collaborative framework with them and we give them real power and we have things like scientific advisory boards for longer studies where they can be uh, members of, then that works really well. They're great partners. And, and the, the reason for that is that they, you know, they, they appreciate being called upon and working in partnership. And, and they typically uh, recognize that the research that we're doing, which is basically trying to understand the impact on patients caregivers, families of diseases and treatments is important work. And particularly, you know, we've worked a lot in rare diseases where there can be really significant unmet needs. And actually, even when uh, uh, new treatments are being developed, perhaps the patient as the patient centered aspect isn't particularly well understood or is not um, emphasized as much as possible. So when we reach out to them in that way, they're typically really, really uh, willing and extremely valuable partners. And Mark, in your area of expertise, data access and data governance are obviously an extremely important area, both to your clients and to patients. How do you work in this space? Well, I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, so some people think governance is, is boring. Actually, I think it's vital and I think it can be a real uh, success factor of certainly of long term studies where you've got lots of different stakeholders. They provide clarity. They provide transparency for our longer term studies. We publish uh, the way we work. Uh, we, we have scientific advisory boards, which are public. You can see who's involved. And that transparency is a really important uh, uh, means of getting people on board. And if we're creating these um, data sets that have been based upon engaged cohorts of patients, there's lots of different things you can do with them. So, you know, research questions at the start of a long study might be different from at the end of the study. And that's normal, right? Because hopefully you're learning things. So some of the data at the beginning might inform, you know, suggest new questions. And secondly, different researchers have different perspectives on data. So we have a very nice framework where even if we're working with a pharmaceutical company, they're the sponsor, they're going to be paying for the, you know, the study. We offer free access to academic researchers. And that's a really nice uh means of, of in, engaging with the, the 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 different stakeholders and i think ultimately that's in the best interest of the patient they want the best research to be done and more most people to have access to their data so when we explain that, that framework we, we we tend to get really positive feedback on it 
All right. Thank you very much for that. Tell me, how do you trans how do you translate the data that comes into you into transparent and accessible information for your clients? Yeah, so th there is there is some back end work that needs to be done. You know, we have an in house team of um, uh, analytics experts who take sort of raw data, analyze it. But but typically, what we will would do is we do this in a very rigorous way. So in the design of a study, we will have an analysis plan. We will have a series of research questions that a sponsor might be interested in. Now, one of the good things about doing uh, real world research is there's lots of possibilities. You can di design studies in different ways. And there's a potential to, uh, to address quite a lot of research questions. Now, the flip side of that is that you know you can get a little, you, your eyes can get a little bit uh, bigger than your stomach in that, that respect. So, you know, it's important to prioritize. So we would typically have a research protocol at the beginning of the study, there'll be a statistical analysis plan. And then as the data are generated, we might have interim analyses that our analytics team uh, uh, conduct based on what was said before the study started in the statistical analysis plan. They get their data and then th those data would be published in sort of you know peer reviewed journals, et cetera. It could be used as part of submissions to health technology assessment agencies. So data from our study have been used with NICE, with ISA in the US, for, for instance. Um, and yeah, it's basically, although this is different uh, hierarchy of evidence from randomized controlled trials, we would still do it as rigorously as possible so that the, under, the ensuing publications are as high quality as possible. Are there ideal instruments used in patient reported outcomes to, to heighten specificity and sensitivity? A absolutely. So in the design of any of our studies, there are lots of sessions where we work with a sponsor about uh, to understand what their research questions are and to essentially put together the appropriate tools to address those questions. Now, from a patient reported outcomes perspective, broadly, you've got instruments that are uh, generic instruments. That means they're not indication specific. So that means they could be about general health related quality of life, for instance. And for, for instance, NICE's uh, instrument uh, EQ5D, that's a, an instrument that's used across not lots of different indications. That has benefit that it's at, you, you can compare how people are doing on EQ5D across indications, which is very interesting. But on the flip side, that those generic instruments don't tend to be that specific. So the other category of instrument is uh, indication-specific instruments. So you might have some uh, instruments that have been developed really with uh, the, the situation of a patient in a particular indication in mind. Give an example, uh, myasthenia gravis, activities of daily living, MGADL. That's about, as its name suggests, how uh, this condition impacts people's daily living who, who are living with it. Now, you can't use that in instrument outside of MG. So it's interesting for MG, but you can't you know, do a read across to other indications. So, Mark, can you tell me about how you minimise patient burden? Uh, companies often have lots of research questions. There's a real trap there if you think, right, this is a great opportunity. I've got, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to answer all of my research questions because the one of the consequences of that can be you overburden patients, and if you overburden patients, they'll turn off, right? So, you've got to remember that there's a patient on the end of this, and you've got to make make the experience for them attractive and if you overburden them you know and they're sick as well they've got some sort of health condition right so you should you should be really cautious about doing that so the patient burden is important and a part of knowing what the right balance is is again testing retesting talking to the advocacy groups mark can you tell me at what point or what point of engagement writer access is normally used at we have worked in both pre-approval use cases and post-approval. Um, post-approval, it's typically where a client will be interested in understanding the effectiveness of their drug in the real world. And that will be perhaps to support some commercial objectives, some value messages that they won't have or they can't support just with their RCT data. Now, pre-approval, it's slightly different. It might be about understanding something to do with the patient condition, 
the burden of disease, natural history of disease. There's, you know, even pre-approval, there's a whole series of research questions. And those can be uh, vary depending on uh, how refined the, uh, a sponsor's understanding of a condition is. Uh, and, and that varies as, as the uh, asset that's being developed in clinical trials progresses through uh, development. But, you know, we typically start maybe at about phase two. We've done, we've done studies uh, supporting um, a product even as early as phase one. The other thing I'd also mention is that if you're doing a long-term study and you want to start early, and of course, everyone always says, start your thinking and your planning early. But if you do start early, we, I recognize, of course, that there's risk involved uh, earlier in, in development. An early study doesn't have to be a big study. You know, think about one country, maybe even one center where you, you launch something, you do a pilot, you learn. And then as the as the asset develops through development, so does your your accompanying uh, real world uh, evidence uh, research. How does a service like yours help with medical device regulations that have just been introduced in Europe? How people now have to survey or watch the outcomes of their devices. Yeah, now, just as a pause on that, we haven't done any of those sort of things. Uh, so, would you? I mean, so let me say what I think we could do. So based on what, you, you know, what you've just said as, as um, that requirement, I think the type of work that we do is, is beautifully suited to that, whereby, you know, we can understand exactly how the patient uh, experience is linked to the use of that medical device. Um, that's just a short answer. Then the, the, the detail becomes, you know, what are the aspects we're interested in? How will we engage with the patients? And again, we're working with uh, device companies to understand that. We, we offer a lot of flexibility. So hopefully that requirement is not a burden, burdensome one for patients and it's pitched at the right level. So those requirements can be fulfilled, but you're not, you know, overly burdening patients. Mark, could you give me a case study that you've done recently? Yeah, we've been involved um, quite a lot of working in uh, rare conditions called myasthenia gravis. So we do a lot of work in rare conditions more generally. One of the reasons for that is often there's a lot of unknowns. You know, there's there's typical by by definition the patient number is quite small. The clinical trials are probably quite small as well, but there's lots of research going in, going on in rare conditions. So many manufacturers are interested in them. In them. So we've done a um, study, an international study that's been running for several years where we've generated data across US, Canada, across Europe, Japan, really quantifying the impact of the disease and the treatments of the disease on patients. So patients download uh, uh, app, study app, they generate PROs across uh, the different aspects of, of, of the, the condition. So um, activities of daily living, fatigue, um, health related quality of life. Um, we have worked with patient advocacy groups in each of the study countries. They're represented on a multi stakeholder uh, scientific advisory board, along with, you know, key opinion leaders for each of the study countries. And so all of those and, you know, we've got probably two and a half thousand patients across those across the 10 countries of the study. And they've been generating data that goes into our uh, cloud based sort of uh, data lake. And we from that, we do interim analysis. We do uh, uh, lots and lots of publications. And that's a really nice data set that can be uh, used to better understand the condition. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, we've got this nice uh, framework where this is available for academic researchers to, to access as well for their research agendas. So I think that's a really nice um, data asset, if you like, for that sort of disease community. All right. Thank you very much for that. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to you again in six months' time when um, Vita Access has um, again challenged everybody. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much.